All righty. <laughs> well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Um, let me just open us real quick in a word of prayer. Lord, we praise you so much for this day. We praise you for the lovely weather outside. We praise you for the frost on the ground this morning. We praise you for the warm, sunny breeze um, on our backs this afternoon. Um, and we praise you for this opportunity we get to hear Emily come speak to us today. Um, please bless the words of her mouth. Um, thank you for everyone who has made it possible for uh, to, for, it, for her to be here today. Thank you to all the ladies at YWA and CBL for making this whole thing possible. But please bless us tonight as we learn more about you. In your name, amen. Um, well, thank you guys so much for coming. Um, first, I'd like to give a thank you to the Claire Booth Luce Center for Conservative Women. Uh, the center exists to provide a conservative woman's perspective on current policy issues that affect her life, country, and faith. And it's often ignored or dismissed by academia and media. And so they really focus on bringing that perspective to the current life. I interned at the center this past summer, and I highly recommend it for all of you ladies. Uh, they provide a wide variety of professional development opportunities, uh, from etiquette seminars to firearm training to planning a lecture on campus. Uh, I'd also like to thank our chapter, YWA chapter president, Sarah Murley, and all of the ladies to help put this event together. Thank you for all your work and dedication. Um, this lecture would not be happening today without you. Thank you, they helped get extra credit, snacks, promote the event, um, and we couldn't be here without them. Uh, thank you to CBL for making this possible too and helping get uh, Emily out here. Um, if you're interested in the YWA, they meet every other Tuesday at 6 p.m. and they focus on advocacy, action, and prayer. Without further ado, I'm Adieu, I'm going to introduce our speaker. Emily Jashinsky is a culture editor, editor at The Federalist and host of Federalist Radio Hour. She previously covered politics as a commentary writer for the Washington Examiner. Prior to joining the Examiner, she was the spokeswoman for Young America's Foundation. She interviewed leading politicians and entertainers and appeared regularly as a guest on major television news programs, including Fox News Sunday, Media Buzz, and the McLaughlin Group. Her work has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Post, Real Clear Politics, and more. She serves as director of the National Journalism Center, co-host of the weekly news show Counterpoints Friday, and a visiting fellow at Independent Women's Forum. Originally from Wisconsin, she's a graduate of George Washington University. Please join me in welcoming Emily Jasinski. Well, thank you all so much for having me here. Thank you to CBL. Thank you. Oh, it's not CBL anymore. It's the Center for Conservative Women. That changed. Uh, I always forget it because uh, when they were the Claire Booth Luce Center for Conservative Women, as opposed to the Center for Conservative Women, uh, Claire Booth Luce Center for Conservative Women, um, I is actually one of my first introductions kind of to the conservative movement. Uh, so I'm very, very grateful to the Center for Conservative Women for everything that they do, to YWA, to Patrick Henry, what a wonderful campus that you have. Uh, also, thank you so much for praying to bless the words from my mouth because uh, I needed that. <laughs> I have a tendency sometimes to stray when I get angry. And I think uh, some of the things we're gonna talk about might make me angry. So you'll all have to keep me in check, but I think the, the blessing will help so very much. Um, let me start actually just by a story of why I was late, because it's interesting um, and somewhat relevant to what we're gonna talk about. Uh, so I was coming from Reston, uh, where YAF has its headquarters, and uh, they've recently put up Google and Tesla, uh, all in, in Reston, Virginia, which sort of used to be, if you talk to people, uh, you know, it was, it was an exurb, basically, not such a suburb of D.C., and that's kind of what these areas are now. It was sort of more like where we are now in Reston, but of course now there's shiny skyscrapers with Google and Tesla and Microsoft. Uh, and as I was coming here, GPS said it would take about a half hour. It took more like 50. And what's interesting is that you start seeing all of these luxury cars get off the highway and start going towards Loudoun County start coming out towards Leesburg, to Purcellville, towards all of these areas. And it made me think of a documentary that we did at The Federalist a couple of years ago, I think two years ago. And it made me think of it even more because we filmed it on a night exactly like tonight, um, right out here in a barn that is used as a wedding venue. You've probably all been there actually, um, but parents were meeting in the basement 
of this old barn that is now used as a wedding venue because it's so gorgeous out here to plot a comeback for Loudoun County uh, because they had discovered in 2020 exactly what was going on in the public schools out here. And to so many of them who had grown up in this area, it was utterly shocking looking at what was in the curriculum. So there's all kinds of wild things that have happened at the Fairfax County Public Schools that have happened at the Loudoun County Public Schools um, when it comes to you know how they're using t- or how they're handling Title IX regulations, etc. But what was in the curriculum when it came to race and when it came to sex and gender was truly shocking to so many of the parents that had made a conscious decision decision to raise their children in Loudoun County because they thought they were in sort of a slice of American heaven, right, to the extent that it exists. Beautiful, sprawling hills, uh, nice, normal people with great American values. And in their own public schools, they were paying, they were sending their kids to, just shocking examples of of racism uh, that had made their way into the curriculum. And I found that to be, especially when we're talking to these parents, especially irritating was what was being taught about race. Some of these parents were immigrants, children of immigrants. Um, They're, you know, in your community, they're your neighbors, you know them. You know exactly the kinds of people that I'm talking about. In fact, you can even watch the documentary on YouTube and see these parents for yourself. It's amazing. And it's because in so many ways, why did they see Loudoun County as the safe, comfortable place to raise their children on good, old-fashioned American values? Because it really we used to agree on what those values were. We used to agree on what made this country fundamentally good. And man, in the last couple of weeks, have we seen that go up in flames on college campuses, not your own, uh, but on college campuses around the country, in newsrooms, from Times Square to London, Uh, We have seen truly disturbing uh, anti-Americanism, anti-patriotism in a way that used to exist at the fringes of our culture and our society and really doesn't anymore. Uh, And the equivalent of that, the sort of decolonization mindset, is what was in textbooks (laughs) for students, right? Like children um, in high school, in middle school, even in elementary school in some case, in some cases. Uh, And that really has to do with all of those luxury cars that I saw coming off of 267 going into Loudoun County. As crazy as that sounds, these are the patterns, the socioeconomic patterns that are changing our ability to relate to each other. And by the way, this is a two-way street, right? So I grew up in Wisconsin. Uh, You know, if you you go up to a bar in Wisconsin and you start a conversation about CNN, you're probably going to be on the same, I'm probably going to be on the same page. We'd probably mostly be on the same page with whoever starts chiming in about CNN at a bar in Wisconsin, uh, for the most part. Um, It's a two-way street, though, from the people at CNN that will talk about Wisconsin all day and have no idea what they're actually talking about from the people of Wisconsin who will talk all day about the big cities and probably not know what they're talking about. There's a difference, though, and that is CNN exercises disproportionate control over the country, (laughs) and they have no idea what they're talking about. And they're also saying that they know exactly what they're talking about. Um, But those, those luxury cars, just to sort of complete the circle on that point, because it's an important one, Increasingly, our socioeconomic differences are cultural differences. There's a great book called Coming Apart by Charles Murray that at the National Journalism Center we make required, required reading in our curriculum. It should be required reading for any journalist. Um, I think it should be required reading for everyone, frankly, because it's the best book about the media that has nothing to do with the media. It's about elite sorting patterns. So if you graduated from college, um, you're more likely to do X y, thing, X, Y, and Z things. So if you graduated from college, you're more likely to make X amount of money. You're more likely to eat at Y restaurants. And you're more likely to, as silly as this sounds, watch Z movies, right? So like, if you input a couple of things into the equation, you're more likely to do a bunch of other things. And those things are very, very different from what they used to be. Uh, so that is to say, people... The, the sort of, um, let's say, blue state luxury car takeover of Loudoun County um, is the, the wealth and power of D.C. bleeding geographically 
um, into all kinds of different regions because, or all kinds of different local communities, uh, because it is so vast. Uh, but we used to live together in ways that we don't anymore. So you used to, uh, for instance, my dad always talks about outside of Milwaukee, how you would go to church with, you know, the people who own Miller Brewery, right? Uh, it doesn't matter, you know, my grandfather's an electrician. Uh, electricians would go to church with and send their kids to the same schools as uh, the people who were running the major local corporation. Uh, and they, they shared, they would watch the same things on TV because there were only three channels. Uh, and all of that has changed for, in some good ways and in some bad ways. Um, and it's, it's a problem with the country more broadly, but it's really a problem with the media. And since that's what I cover most closely, I'd love to talk a little bit about that right now. I do just want to emphasize, though, that these problems are affecting all of us every single day. Um, that there's something happening actually right in our backyard as we talk right now uh, that's relevant to it. And of course, um, that this, I think, lens is one that unlocks a whole lot of other truths about our politics. So once you kind of understand the trends that have ruined the media, you can see some of these trends in a lot of the problems in our politics. Does that make sense? Awesome. Okay, and if it doesn't, I love taking questions. So keep those in mind, and we'll talk a little bit, have a back and forth towards the end. Um, think about Betty White. You guys know who Betty White was? Betty White. Uh, may she rest in peace. So Betty White. I saw someone shake their head. I think this is the first time I've seen anybody shake their head to Betty White. Not to pick on you. <laughs> uh, Betty White was the star of The Golden Girls, uh, which was an old, old sitcom that I actually... Uh, don't expect anyone to even know about. Um, and I'm always surprised that so many people continue to know Betty White. Um, it's, it's not surprising to me at all, I guess, that some of you don't know who Betty White is because I'm usually surprised when I ask that. And people are like, oh, I would love Betty White because she became something of a uh, social media fixture, you know, like a meme um, towards the end of her life uh, because she lived to be so old. Uh, Betty White was born in 1922. 1922. Warren G. Harding was the president when Betty White was born. Betty White, television star, died in 2021. The world looked pretty much like it looks right now when a woman who was born in the administration of Warren G. Harding died. That is bizarre. It is historically bizarre. It's actually civil civilizationally and I made up that adverb just for you, bizarre. That's really strange. That has never happened in the scope of human history that life has changed that quickly in such a short period of time. And I'm not specifically just saying from 1922 to 2021, um, but in general, this is something that's happening. It's, it's called Hyper Novelty. Brett Weinstein and Heather Hying wrote a really great book about it. It's called The Hunter-Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century. Uh, they are evolutionary bio biologists and they call this hypernovelty when the rate of change outpaces our ability to adapt. Uh, so, for instance, a lot of people will look back on the wristwatch or the printing press and say, calm down, technology is uh, not destroying humans. We used to be addicted to looking at our wristwatches, and the printing press was very disruptive. Um, and as a Lutheran, that's not a persuasive argument to me. But this is maybe the only place I'll get laughs on that line. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it, it, what's happening right now is on a different level. Um, and you know, I'm, I know some of you are here for extra credits in, in, in your physics class. Frankly, I can't get too scientific about this uh, because I've never taken a physics class. <laughs> but you can now tell your physics professor that uh, we injected some science into the conversation uh, because I mentioned evolutionary biology. Uh, so, but think about that. I mean, so Warren G. Harding is born in the last year of the Civil War. A woman who was born during his presidential administration just died, like a famous celebrity. Like she just passed away. What has happened between point A and point B is nuts. And the reason I like to talk about Betty White is because she was, according to PBS, the very first woman to ever appear on a brand new technology called television. Before TV debuted at the World's Fair in 1939, shortly after Betty White turned 17, 
she was on an experimental RCA broadcast. TV was not even commercially available when she got into that game. It was an experiment. This woman's life ran the gamut from an experiment on TV to being one of the biggest TV stars ever and dying in the age of TikTok when TV is barely even a thing anymore. It's like YouTube and TikTok. So think about that. Everything's kind of black and white then. Think about like 2106, that's 83 years from now. So Betty White died 83 years from an experimental television broadcast. What will the world that your children and your grandchildren inherit look like? You know, let's say you're 99, 83 years from now, something like that. Um, it's pretty daunting to try to imagine what the world is going to look like. And when we think about news, it's kind of important to focus on the most fundamental, the most basic elements of what journalism is. Even when I grew up, the news wasn't on the internet yet. Um, it was, you, know, you still had to tune into the nightly news, read a newspaper, subscribe to a periodical like National Review, um, and then as I got a little older, you could log on to the internet. You still had to dial it up, which you guys probably don't remember. Um, so, you know, you, you can Google it. Uh, it'll take you a lot quicker than it would have in 2000 um, to figure out what that actually looked like. But basically there was a dial tone, you had to wait a couple of minutes to connect to the internet. Um, and so there wasn't any like social media. There were forums where people would talk about the news, uh, but there wasn't social media where it was a constant feed of other people's thoughts in that gamified way, right? Uh, there wasn't rewards. Uh, for your take on the news, rewards or punishments for your take on the news, and that wasn't the incentive for people to do the news. So for instance, now, the way journalists communicate the news, all of those reporters in Capitol Hill, uh, they are breaking the news to you on a platform that has gamified their reporting, right? So they know if they talk about it in a very particular way, uh, if they tweet it with a picture, the algorithm's gonna prize that over just tweeting a sentence with no picture. If they tweet it with all caps or if they tweet it with whatever, they know that's going to do better. Exit, whatever. Um, that's much more difficult to say. Um, that's what the last 10 years? I mean, barely the last decade. Uh, but it's fundamentally changing the way that you as consumers learn about the world. Media is the window through which regular people are able to access and understand the world of public affairs. Uh, so that includes business, government, all of those things. That's the window. And if the window is smudged and cracked, it's a problem because the founders, as you all well know, um, made the freedom of the press essential. They know that you can't have what we call a constitutional republic without a free press. And technology uh, doesn't necessarily mean that that window is going to be smudged and cracked. Uh, but it has created new challenges and we haven't caught up to them. Does that make sense? So we are still behind. The technology has changed so quickly that we haven't found a way to make sure the free press, that window, is still functioning in the way that it absolutely must for the entire system to work. It's a fragile ecosystem, right? Like con you guys are learning this right now. The system of a constitutional republic is fragile. When one thing is off, uh, it, it throws the entire system into uh, chaos, right? You have to have everything working right and in the, the, the way that it was intended in order for everything to exist smoothly. It doesn't mean these challenges aren't always going to be with it, uh, with us, but it does mean that right now media is one of our, our biggest, biggest challenges. So it, we can talk about what is news and what isn't. Basically, journalism is the practice of either conveying or analyzing facts in the public's interest. You can do it by writing or speaking, you can do it with pictures, you can do it with video, but because journalism deals first and foremost in facts, journalists must first accept, oh, and this is so hard, that facts exist. That facts exist. News is about new information. So that's why journalists are tasked with gathering that new information and then conveying that new information. So it's one thing to be there when something happens or to get information about what happened. It's another thing to write or speak about it accurately. Both are important, but both are different. So if I saw a, say a red truck outside this building, I could say there is a red truck outside of Founders Hall. 
I could say there is a large red truck outside Founders Hall or a new expensive Ford F-150 parallel parked uh, against a curb outside of Washington, D.C. Or I could call it a polluting gas guzzler. Or I could call it the most popular car in America, which is actually what the Ford F-150 is. I could tell you if somebody's inside it. I could tell you what they look like. I could tell you about the weather. I could tell you all of that. But if my job is to tell you about the truck, I sort of necessarily have to pick and choose in order to be accurate and in order to be helpful, right? So I can't, as a journalist, give you literally every detail about that truck, A, because you don't care, <laughs> uh, and, and B, like I could go through what rims it has, I could go through if the lights are working, I could go through all of these different things, all the different scrapes and cuts and the bumper if I'm thinking about my own truck, um, but the bottom line is you are not interested in everything. You're interested in a very particular set of facts and that is the news and the new information. So you're necessarily picking and choosing as a journalist. A lot of people talk about unbiased journalism. Uh, I think we all know what we mean when we talk about unbiased journalism, but I will say that is theoretically impossible. There is no way for news to be unbiased because you are determining what the news is. Uh, there's no way to convey everything in the world that is happening on a newspaper. Consumers want a newspaper or consumers want a website. There's just absolutely no way. There are billions of people in the world. There are you know, hundred, more than 100 countries. Uh, there's this, the square footage of the globe, uh, it's just impossible, right, to cover every new information. So you are necessarily picking and choosing. Uh, and so that act is what we have to be honest about. Uh, if you say you're dealing with facts, and this is where everything is breaking down right now. If you say you're dealing with facts, you have to do your very best to deal with facts. If you say you're dealing with facts and opinions, that's fine. You still have to do your best, but you're being honest. And if you're being dishonest, we have a big problem. So the Washington Post, the New York Times have recently restyled themselves or re-emphasized their goal as being, what, what did CNN do? They ran that ad. Do you, have you guys seen the apple and banana ad? If you haven't, look it up. CNN in the middle of the Trump administration ran an ad where they just showed an apple on the screen. They had a voice that said, this is an apple. Some people may try to tell you it's a banana, but it's an apple. What is the implication there? That they are the guardians of truth and facts, uh, and that everybody else is out there trying to muddy the waters and cloud it with opinion and alternative facts, but CNN is just telling you that apples are apples. That's obviously absurd from CNN um, for so many different reasons, uh, particularly because they had people that they were saying were unbiased journalists who were just out there openly flaunting their biases. Um, but now, they don't see those things as biases. And this is where the breakdown happens. Uh, think of, you guys remember what happened with Co Covington Catholic? Yeah, okay, so you'll, as I describe this image, it'll probably pop back into your head. Uh, young white kid with a MAGA hat on the National Mall and a Native American activist coming at him. So when images started to go viral of this, uh, this was 2018, I think, it may have been early 2017, somewhere around there. Uh, and CNN, by the way, lost a lawsuit about its coverage of this to the tune of like, they had to settle for millions of dollars, presumably. I think it was like $7 million. Uh, I don't know if it's actually been confirmed, but millions of dollars. So this young kid is on a class trip and they're at the National Mall after the March for Life and a Native American activist starts getting in his face. It goes viral. He's sitting there with a grin on his face um, and someone just posted the most misleading snippet of it on Twitter. From there, journalists who spend literally all of their time on Twitter instead of like talking to people um, are retweeting that this kid was like smugly mocking indigenous activists, this like young pro-life Catholic kid, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that was not the full story at all, but they had relied on a snippet of video that they saw to tell their audience that this apple was a banana because they didn't do their work. They are almost all based in Washington, DC. They are all on Twitter all of the time. They had all of the tools in their world at the dis in the world at their disposal to confirm this story was accurate. But they ran with this apple as a banana right away. Um, the Washington Post did it. All kinds of news outlets did that. Why? 
because it confirmed, did what we call confirming your priors, right? It felt right to them that this young white boy would smugly be mocking this Native American activist. And of course, what actually happened is that the activist was getting up in this kid's face and uh, taunting him, provoking him, basically. And so that grin that so much of the media saw as smug was actually really restrained and polite. <laughs> you have someone getting in your face and you're smiling, you're smiling it off. You're not doing anything wrong. You're not shouting, getting angry. You're just smiling and nodding. So it's one of those classic uh, pictures where like you can't tell if it's a lamp or an old woman. You know what I mean? Right? Like it just depends on the perspective that you bring to it. It's exactly that. Um, it's like a, an optical illusion, right? Uh, and at the end of the day, that artist painted the optical illusion to be an optical illusion. So it's neither a lamp or an older woman. It's, it's both, right? Like you don't have to pick or choose. Uh, that's the sort of reality of it. But when you look at it, you'll see it in one of two different ways, depending on the perspective that you are bringing to it. And that's definitely what happens with news. The problem is so many people are insisting that they are seeing apples when what they are actually publishing is just banana, right? Like I actually love this metaphor that CNN gave us because it's really perfect. Uh, and you can't, it's fine. For instance, like what I do is opinion journalism. I, I never ever make my audience think that I'm anything other than a conservative, right? That would be really dishonest because I know a handful of people in journalism that can do the news and do it straight. Um, the vast majority of people I know in journalism cannot. The vast majority of people I know in journalism that are working at mainstream media outlets that I've met are politically engaged, interested people that necessarily have opinions on things like abortion. Uh, and those opinions are almost all to the left, right? Um, and that's fine. You're allowed to have the wrong opinion on abortion. You're allowed to have uh, an opinion on abortion. What you can't do is say that you are just being a neutral broker of facts when there's no way that you can do that, right? Again, like there's some people who constitutionally are just so neutral, they're not even interested. A lot of the reporters that I meet that do this really well are not even interested in politics. They're interested in reporting because they like to talk to people and they like to write and they just kind of found themselves in political reporting. Uh, but people who are in reporting because they love politics, which is a lot of people, they can't report well. Uh, they, they just can't report well from a neutral perspective. They can report fabulously well from an opinion perspective. For instance, it brings you all kinds of benefits. So if you're a conservative journalist, people in the Freedom Caucus are happy to talk to you. So when there's a speaker confirmation battle and the Freedom Caucus is instrumental, I can probably do a pretty good job of giving you the facts of what the Freedom Caucus thinks because I'm talking to them all the time. But because I'm talking to them all the time, the only reason they're talking to me is because they know I mostly agree with them, <laughs> right? So it gives you an advantage, and that's why the left has all of this insight into the Biden administration. But what they're not able to do is publish that insight into the Biden administration neutrally. And it's a catch-22, right? It's why they have it at the same time. Does that make sense? Uh, and so the, the real problem is the lie. And so we have to get to the heart of the lie. That's like the most interesting part of all of this. Uh, social science has developed what they call, quote, super zips. We're actually in one right now, um, probably one of the, the highest super zips. Um, they're the wealthiest places in the country, and they're where most journalists live. And again, uh, to the point where I was talking about how this lens sort of unlocks a lot of truths about our politics in general, um, once you realize that, you realize we make a whole lot of decisions because of super zips. Uh, we make a whole lot of decisions in one way, or the way Hollywood depicts this country is one way. Uh, a lot of that comes down to super zips. Uh, now, people who live in these areas, and let's focus back on journalists, they generally went to the same schools, they generally make the same amount of money, live in the same regions, they generally have the same approach to religion, watch the same movies, go to the same stores, so they're actually unable to realize that a lot of the things the left agrees on are not settled facts. That's coming as close to the heart of this problem as you can possibly get. Now, if we wanted to keep digging deeper, 
as you guys do here, um, we could talk about, and I alluded to it earlier, the fact that we don't even agree on facts anymore, right? That we don't even agree that truth is not relative. That has become so mainstream for people, whether they know it or not. I think a lot of people, um, I'm, I'm not that much older than you, I think a lot of people our age, um, born in the 90s, early 2000s, were born into an America in which moral relativism was the water that we were swimming in. Uh, and so it has just colored the way so many people our age think about the world, and they might even n not know it, right? Like they don't know, they, they wouldn't walk into you know, the grocery store and say, I'm a moral relativist. First of all, they wouldn't do that because why would somebody say that in a grocery store? But uh, secondly, <laughs> it was just an example that came to me. And, probably wasn't the best, but uh, they wouldn't walk in, up to you in a conversation about politics at a barbecue and identify themselves as a proud moral relativist. Uh, but they may, for instance, say that gender is fluid, right? They may have some of these ideas and they may actually claim their science to back them up. Or if they are a real dyed in the wool moral relativist, they will tell you that science doesn't matter, that your sort of internal, your truth, your internal sense of reality your perception of reality is the same thing as reality. And that's wrong. Um, there is truth, it is objective. We don't even need to debate that. Uh, but that's really what's at the heart of this. Um, now, we'll just, as, as that is the, like, the real deep question, we could have a million different questions. Uh, I would, I uh, mean, we can talk about this during questions, but we could uh, raise a bunch of different questions about how I think technology has brought us to that place um, about where questioning reality and relativistic truth uh, is something that you know Marx and Nietzsche are focused intently on because of technology. Um, we can have that conversation. That is like the deepest possible layer here. Uh, but to keep it right at this level of like what really, uh, where we see most journalists depart from the job that they say they're doing, it's because they are living in super zips. And that means uh, that they mostly, I was just talking to a guy, he works for the Associated Press. He was overseas um, in the Middle East. It was, he was a bureau chief somewhere in the Middle East until a couple of years ago. He moved back to cover American politics for the Associated Press, like smack in the middle of the Trump administration. But he'd been overseas for a really long time. And he sort of looked around and was like, what's going on here? And his job now is basically to talk to Trump supporters uh, in the upper Midwest. It's where I'm from. And are any of you guys from Midwest, upper Midwest? Right, right, okay, cool. Okay, so you know culturally how different it is um, from Washington, D.C. If you're from the South, you know culturally how different it is from Washington, D.C. Um, and again, that's a sort of a two-way street. Uh, but he was talking about how basically the, uh, the different lifestyle that people live in different places of the country is so vast, that gulf, cultural gulf between one part of the country and the other is so vast that you can't even really explain it to somebody who lives in a city. And again, I think that goes both ways. Uh, but for instance, most journalists, I don't actually have a poll on this. Uh, I just, this is anecdotally, I've been doing this in Washington DC for a while and I know a lot of people who do it in New York and I know people who do it in LA. I would guess most journalists don't have a car. Does that change the way they cover the economy? Paul Krugman recently, he's in, what is he, he won a Pulitzer or maybe even a Nobel Prize, one of the two. He's an economist who has a column at the New York Times. Uh, he wrote a column recently about how inflation's not that bad. It's not that bad. Uh, well, I don't know if he has a car, but I do know a lot of the other people in his newsroom who edited that and worked on that story uh, and let that go up and let this man embarrass himself in front of the entire world probably don't have cars. Um, right now, depending on where you live in the country especially, your gas prices are crazy high. Have any of you guys tried to buy a car, in a used car in the last couple of years? It's insane. Um, the used car market is nuts. If you want to buy a car um, and take out a loan, which is how most people buy cars, it's almost impossible. If you want to buy a house right now, if you're not a homeowner um, and you're looking to be a homeowner, so you're a younger person, it's truly crazy. Like there will be a million stories in the press about student debt because journalists all went to liberal arts schools where they paid too much money um, and have student debt. But 
you don't get nearly as much coverage as the other things that sort of affect the everyday lives of average Americans. Um, it's actually really remarkable how different that is. Um, and think about how that how they cover, just like gas prices is one example, but for instance, delinquencies right now on car loans are spiking. This is a really scary sign for the economy. Basically, you hear nothing about that. Credit card delinquencies are spiking. Um, we're hearing very little about that in the media right now because most journalists are uh, above average in the income bracket. So it's just not like on their minds. And I would actually argue the same thing about welfare. Um, it, it's true that like my mom wouldn't let me go into journalism because she was like, yeah, it's, you know, I went to GW. So she was like, you're not going to make enough money. Like I, I'm not paying for you to go to GW if you're going to go be a journalist. Um, but that's kind of a misconception, right? Like you don't make a lot of money the first couple of years in journalism, but compared to people who don't go to college, compared to your peers, you're doing pretty well in journalism. You're, you're living in a major city. Um, some of these shops are unionized. I said shop referring to a newsroom because that's how they refer to them, but wow. Um, it's not a shop, uh, although it used to be a much more blue collar profession. We can talk about that too. Um, but you know, they're, they're doing okay um, compared to people who, you know, they may have credit, they may have student loan debt. They probably don't have crazy credit card debt. They probably don't have, uh, you know, to worry about cars. They're not worried about gas because they're not worried about cars. They're not worried about insurance because they're not worried about cars. Um, they don't go to church. They don't own guns. Uh, these are really like gun coverage is horrible. Uh, why is that? It's not just because journalists hate guns. What's deeper than that? They don't know anything about guns. They've never lived in an area uh, where, you know, if you call 911 because someone's breaking into your home, the cops are going to take 20 minutes. Some of you probably know that because you grew up in rural areas. Uh, they don't know what that's like. They have a police station a couple of blocks down. Um, it's inconceivable to people who live in cities or grow up in suburbs that you actually might need to take matters into your own hands uh, or you hunt or anything like that. Um, that is as good an example of any of where these sort of cultural touchstones are di more and more different. Uh, depending on your income level, depending on uh, your education level. Uh, and so think about this. Uh, a great example is the COVID lab leak, right? Why on earth? Why on earth was everyone calling that a racist conspiracy theory? The idea that COVID escaped from a lab, hysterically calling that a racist conspiracy theory, trying to cancel people who said maybe this leak from the lab that's right on the street. Uh, why? Why on earth would that have anything to do? Like, how, how does bias even explain that, right? It's such a weird thing to see bias on. Well, as soon as one person says something is potentially racist, everyone is terrified to touch it, right? They, it just, everyone jumped on that bandwagon. It got called a conspiracy theory, and it just uh, metastasized into this absurd line. You can go back and look at the media coverage. It was... They were saying, like, discredited conspiracy theory. Like, that's how they were in straight news referring to these things. Um, so they don't even actually realize that their facts are debatable because they don't live around people who disagree with them. They don't talk to people who disagree with them. They don't worship with people who disagree with them. They don't understand people or know people who disagree with them. And that's really new. We haven't always lived like that as a country. We, have, we haven't also always had the sort of media climate where... So let's say when my parents were growing up, um, there was the nightly news because there was three channels because cable hadn't come around yet and democratized news media. If you watch Anchorman 2, it's actually a great story about what cable news did to the media. But um, you can watch that on your own time. I don't need to recap it here because most of you have probably seen it. It's a great film. But it was a brand new thing to have all of these different channels. And with those different channels came things like Fox News, came things like 24-hour news. Before it used to be you sat down, you watched the 5 o'clock news, or you watched the 10 o'clock news, you got the morning paper, maybe you got the evening paper, uh, you would watch the Sunday shows, and that's how you got news. Maybe you subscribed to a magazine like National Review or something. That's how you got the news. Um, the cable comes along, you can get partisan news, blah, blah, blah. That's actually a return to what the country was like in its earliest days. And some of you probably know that. We've always had a pretty partisan press in this country. You had the Federalists and you had the Whigs and they were like doing news in a very partisan and 
somewhat mean-spirited way, right? Um, and that was the norm until, really, until technology made it possible for news to travel really quickly. And then the way it was supported was by advertisers. We're actually going back to more of a subscriber consumer model. Um, but when, especially in the 20th century, radio comes along, when newspapers come along um, in the format that they were for a while, it was supported by getting as many people as possible to want to tune into your broadcast, right? So what gets CBS to get ABC viewers and NBC viewers? You have to appeal to the most number of people possible because you want the most number of people possible to buy ads on your channel, right? You need to support your show with commercials and commercials are more and more valuable or ads in the paper are more and more valuable the more eyeballs are looking at them. So at the time, it was just it, the way the media was at the time was just to appeal to as many people as possible. That's changed now because of technology. It's sort of gone back to the way it was and that the way to get most people to subscribe um, let's think about one example. Do any of you know who Johnny Carson is? Even before my time, but yeah. So Johnny Carson hosted like the most popular late night show. It's the one that Jimmy Fallon hosts now um, for years and years and years. And he was, he didn't avoid politics at all. He just wasn't partisan. Um, now the most popular late night host during the Trump administration was the most partisan man in media. Does anyone know who it was? Stephen Colbert. Stephen Colbert, horrible. He's not funny. He used to be kind of funny uh, when he was doing the Colbert Report, but not funny at all and super, super political. And that used to be like a no-no. You wouldn't want to be talking about politics during your late night show um, because it would scare off advertisers and people would switch to the other show if you were overly partisan. Just, it wouldn't appeal to people. Um, why did that change? Because people have so many options now that the new business model is to appeal to uh, as much of a loyal niche as possible. So this is the next wave in how media is changing and how our politics and culture are changing because of media. And think of how that's going to affect the problem of facts and not being able to agree on facts or whether there even are facts, like not, let alone being able to agree what the facts are, but agreeing whether there are facts. This is gonna make the problem so much worse because instead of sharing uh, touchstones, we are going to, and when the partisan press was around in the early days of the country, we actually did share a lot of sort of general values. Um, you know, and some of them, by the way, like whether women should be able to vote, which is sort of unquestionable, I would argue were bad values. Some of you may disagree with that, but there were a shared, there was more consensus on kind of how politics and culture will, would work, some for the better, some for the worse. For instance, there was a much better consensus on God um, and on Christ in the country at the time. Um, that does not exist in any way whatsoever now. And the more that we nicheify because of the way technology and media are changing, the more that we're going to be in these echo chambers and the more that we're not going to agree on facts and we're not going to agree on whether facts actually exist. So, I mean, think about that. And think about how that affects just the basic art of conveying new information to an audience. Uh, if people who say that's my job to do it can't be honest about what they're doing and are telling you that you're looking at an apple when you're looking at a banana, it's a really bad thing. And my solution is just to embrace the banana, right? Tell people that you're openly an opinion person. Tell people that you're on the left, tell people that you're on the right. Uh, I host a show every Wednesday with a full on socialist uh, named Ryan Grimm. He's fantastic, he's a great guy. Uh, we could not disagree more on things. He is the best reporter in Washington, I would argue. He's an open leftist, and he gets some amazing scoops that way. But he's honest. You know that when he's writing about Israel, he's coming from the perspective of the hard democratic socialist left. And as a reader, you're smart enough to figure that out and make that judgment. Uh, you don't need him to condescend to you and to protect you from facts and truth and to lie to you because, and this is the uh, justification for censorship we see so often, you can't be trusted with information because you will take that information and vote for Donald Trump. You will take that information and watch Fox News. Or you will take that information and read a Tucker Carlson book, God forbid. Um, they don't trust you with information because they fundamentally don't trust you if you don't agree with them. And they don't trust you if you don't agree with them because they don't know you. They have no interest in knowing you. So the, at the heart of the problem in our media and our politics, and I'll close on this note and go to questions, um, is just this fundamental problem of socioeconomic and socio sociological sorting that is keeping us apart from each other. And it's a two-way street, but the people in power 
have not reckoned with that. They don't understand what they don't know. They don't know what they don't know. They have no interest in knowing what they don't know. And in fact, they're hostile to knowing what they don't know, um, but they're disproportionately powerful. So on that, I'll take questions happily. I hope that was helpful. And thank you so much again for having me out here. Also, uh, as a director of the National Journalism Center, I do stuff like this a lot with students, and um, I'm really good at staring in uncomfortable silence uh, for people to ask questions. So I will do it, and it will not be fun. Go for it. So um, I think just kind of have your talk for definitely really, like we know that this is, we've had ideas of what things are going on, but then we really explain it this way. It's kind of, it's definitely disheartening, especially when you, you know, you're on social media all the time, it's hard to know what to trust. What do you see as a way going forward that even we as young people now can, like we recognize this as a problem? Mm -hmm. What are some steps that we can take, um, even just in our practical life, you know, it seems like, what do we trust, you know? Totally. No, that's a great question. Uh, I think w one of the solutions to this is people in general, and sadly, because you shouldn't have to, but people in general are going to have to get very media literate. Um, you know, all of us, friends and family, uh, there should be a way to teach it somehow in schools or, like, just easy ways for people to think about it. But... Um, and I think what that means is that we're all going to have to read more sources and know more about those sources. Uh, so you used to, and this is a change, uh, definitely like if you talk to your parents, they used to be able to open up USA Today and watch the Today Show and feel pretty good about what they just learned. And they would have a better grasp on news than if they did that now, that's for sure. Um, but now what I would recommend is really reading sources that are open about their bias and not reading sources that are pretending they don't have a bias. So for instance, and that's really difficult, especially with foreign news, because partisan outlets, so like the Federalist, we don't have any money to send people to Israel, right? Like we don't have anybody in the ground, on the ground in Israel. So what we can do is try to synthesize what we're seeing from Reuters and Al Jazeera and the Associated Press as best we can from the perspective of a generally pro-Israel publication. Um, so it's harder with foreign affairs, but especially in domestic affairs, like I, I read tons of stuff on the uh, like honest outright left um, because they a generally have the best versions of their own arguments, um, which I think are bad arguments, but it's the best version of that argument. So then you can weigh it against the conservatives. And when you're reading conservative partisan press, it's great because theoretically that's the best version of the conservative argument. So if you're reading coverage of, uh, for instance, what happened on October 7th in Israel, you're reading it from the left, you're reading it from the right, you can then decide what you want to plug into Wikipedia and get to the bottom of, right? Like you can figure out like, oh, what happened in the Yom Kippur War? Um, I've read it about it on the left. I've read about what the right said about it. Um, you know, you're just gonna, we, we all just have to put in more effort. And I think that sucks. I don't think that should be uh, the way that it actually is. Um, I don't think that's right because I think we're all being lied to by people who tell us that they're giving us the facts on a silver platter. I don't think that's healthy for people to have to put so much effort in. But the only other solution I think would be to wind back the clock on technology or suddenly convince, you know, a generation of journalists that uh, you know, they are wrong, their fundamental worldview is wrong. And I just don't think that's going to happen um, at, at all. Uh, I mean, some people are hopeful that'll happen at some point, but I really don't think it will. Um, so I think our best bet is to at least get our news from people who are being honest about the biases that they have. And like, I'll still read CNN sometimes, especially like, again with foreign coverage, because they have the money to send people on a trip that the president does um, a the dirty little secret of the industry is that if you want to send a reporter as a news outlet to cover a foreign trip the president takes, it costs tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, if he goes on a trip to Europe, for example, they'll charge you like $50,000 as a journalist just to cover the trip. It's crazy. It's, like, it's just a, a crazy way the world works. Um, but that's why a lot of partisan outlets, they just would never have the money to do that compared to, you know, Jeff Bezos back in the Washington Post. So it, it's just you have to weigh more sources, put in more effort, and you know, do the best that way. Also, there's so many, we have a lot of access to primary sources now, so you can watch the full school board meeting on YouTube, um, and you can find the minutes online. So it's just a matter of like putting in more and more effort, unfortunately. Yeah, go for it. 
Yeah, so um, continue with my spot on solutions. Um, is there any way that that uh, both both liberal and conservative journals can be incentivized to leave their own echo chambers? Mm -hmm. uh, because that's because like when, when the the liberal journals that I met, like uh, I had the other students said, yeah, we we get news on on TikTok or on social media, and I want I want I want to say that that that's not news. That's an echo chamber. <laughs> you're not you're not getting really. Um, so how do we even go about solving that? How do we like do we incentivize journalists to the liberal journalists live to just go to rural areas and vice versa to see the, the other side of the world? Mm -hmm. That's another really good question. Uh, one thing I would say is, um, and it goes with the last question, is to read these sources yourself because uh, and subscribe. And I know your students, like that's asking a lot of the average American, but um, subscribing to sources that have subscription features actually incentivizes that journalism. So for instance, there's this guy, Matt Taibbi, who did a lot of, some of you probably know him, he did a lot of the Twitter files reporting. Same thing with Barry Weiss, who used to be at the New York Times. Matt used to be at New York Magazine, or Rolling Stone, he used to be at Rolling Stone. Um, but they both got pushed out not for being conservative. Neither of them is conservative. Matt is a hard leftist. Uh, they got pushed out by the left at the publication because they questioned the left on a couple of things, basically. And they knew that in this new tech atmosphere, it's good, there's good and bad with it, that they would be able to get enough subscribers to make a living. Um, I know one person who got pushed out of New York Magazine. When they started a Substack, within like a day, they had enough subscribers, within a day, to make $750,000 a year just on their Substack which is a crazy amount of money. That's, I guarantee you is more than that person was making at New York Magazine. Uh, so I would say, A, like, we are all part of that incentive system. So make sure like, to subscribe and read. If you can't afford, like, read those publications. Follow them on social media. That's super, super helpful. Um, and on the other hand, I mean, <laughs> I think it would be great for like a local news resurgence. A lot of this has happened because people, especially journalists, are more disconnected um, now because they never had to go through the pipeline. A lot of people go straight to national and they don't do their stint at the Cincinnati Inquirer covering the opioid crisis. They just jump straight to CNN. Um, and that's because there aren't a lot of local news jobs. Uh, most of the news jobs have been nationalized. So I think I hope that there's an infusion of capital into local news. I know some people are toying with it. They're toying with it in partisan ways. They're toying with it in nonpartisan ways. But I do think like having that stepping stone would be really helpful for journalists, whether they're liberal or conservative or neutral. Um, in some outlets, like the Associated Press, have sent people, like the guy I was talking about recently, uh, to Minneapolis and to other parts of the country. That I don't know if it works really well. It's worked really well for him. Um, for everyone, I think if you're, you're coming into this, um, have you seen Vengeance with B.J. Novak from The Office? It works for him, right, when he goes and does a podcast in West Texas and he kind of changed his mind. Uh, I've just, you know, I've lived in D.C. for 12 years now. I've seen a lot of hardened hearts um, who really think conservatives are necessarily, if you voted for Trump, you are necessarily a racist. That's something somebody said on CNN. Um, if you you know, uh, own guns, you are complicit in every school shooting. I think there are a lot of people that it would actually just like exacerbate their biases because they're so hardened to that right now. Um, so I don't know about that solution, but I hope that before these people get so hardened, maybe they can go to local places first. Yeah. Uh, so you never owning a big truck, never owning a gun, never living in the country. Uh, I, I'm curious, uh, I see from your business card that your office is in. No, they were getting it. I'm curious, and you didn't mention you own the thing of truck, so there's a little bit of difference. Used to. But, oh, you used to, okay. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious, like, you used to. what's your background? Like, do yeah. you fit into that, that same issue, and what do you do to try to escape that bubble? Yeah. Do you fit into that, that same issue, and what do you do to try to escape that bubble? hundred percent, and it's a great question. So I was in Vegas for the Society of Professional Journalism panel uh, a few weeks ago which like it was as crazy as you could imagine. Like when I checked in, there were like pronoun badges and everything else uh, because that's normal, right? They don't realize that's not normal in other parts of the country. Um, and I was the lone conservative, I think at the entire conference, I actually met one other person, but in, of the speakers at the entire conference, I think I was the only person from conservative media. And they had me on a panel uh, with, other, with liberals uh, to explain and translate conservative journalism. 
and the conservative voter and the conservative reader. And I said to them in the middle of it, I was like, I can like mediate for you, but you shouldn't be talking to me. You should find somebody who is actually not a DC based uh, liberal arts school journalism graduate. Like I, I'm, I, I can tell you, like I grew up in Wisconsin, my family's all in Wisconsin. Um, you know, and they were talking about hunting and I was like, my dad is hunting right now. Like I, I looked at my watch. I was like, he's literally in the woods. Um, I'm not like I'm here in Vegas, <laughs> uh, talking to all of you about the keyboard warrior game, uh, that I play every day. Uh, like you need to find people that aren't me. And so again, like, I actually think it's, it is really important. And sometimes I have to like catch myself because I moved to DC in 2011. Uh, I've always lived in downtown DC. I've never even lived out as far as this. Um, and that was actually really helpful for me because I grew up in the country. So I feel like I have been able to sort of get both. Um, but I haven't lived in Wisconsin for a really long time now. Um, and that's why, so the Federalist is called the Federalist because it's the Federalist model applied to media, right? That, uh, for instance, one thing we publish a lot of moms, um, a lot of journalists are not mothers um, because to be a journalist, it really disincentivizes motherhood and journalists are disproportionately not religious. Um, they don't, you know, th there are all those cultural reasons. Um, and so Federalists, our model encourages women who are not professional writers and men too, uh, to write about motherhood because that is a voice. I don't care if you're on the left or the right and you're a mom, you don't have a voice in media for the most part. If you're a mom in Kansas, I don't care if you're voting Democrat or Republican. What I want is for you to have a platform. Um, and this anecdote that's really important is uh, in 20, do you guys remember Roy Moore, the special election in Alabama? Some of you do. Okay, so uh, after Jeff Sessions was appointed by Donald Trump to be attorney general, there was a special election in Alabama and a Democrat won. Uh, why did a Democrat win? Because Republicans nominated this rabble rouser named Roy Moore. Um, and this is not to debate his candidacy, but he had a ton of allegations thrown at him that when he was in his 30s, he had been dating and preying on teenage girls. And the entire media spent weeks, weeks, asking, why is 50% of Alabama about to go out and vote for Roy Moore, despite all of these allegations against him? Why? Someone please tell us why. So the Federalist published an article from an Alabama voter saying, I'm going to vote for Roy Moore, even though he has all these allegations against him. Why? Because the other guy is fully in favor of abortion up until the moment of birth. And then they tried to cancel the Federalist for publishing the op-ed that they had been begging for. We put it on a silver platter for them. And uh, they didn't even want to hear it um, because they just wanted to like engage in, in silly, reflexive cancel culture. Um, and so our job, like one thing that we really try to do at the Federalist, and I wish other publications did it, is to bring local voices. Again, we publish people on the left. I don't care if you're on the right or the left. If you're somebody who is uh, in a different socioeconomic background or lives geographically somewhere different, um, there was a really funny Twitter thing like 10 years ago where journalists figured out that the Ford F-150 was the most, was the highest, best-selling car in America at that time. I think it still is. Um, and journalists had no idea how stupid they sounded. They were like, how can this be true? I don't know anybody who drives a Ford F-150. Like, that's the car that I drove growing up. But like, if you look around, it's like the most popular car. It's obviously the most popular car in the country if you're outside DC or New York. Um, and so it, it was just like, they don't even know what they don't know. And then they don't even want to know what they don't know. Like you, they, they know, they can't quite figure out why people are voting against the pro-choice guy. But when you tell them, they're like, no, 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 get that away from me. That is, that is too icky. Um, so I think it's like really, really important for outlets to try and give voice to people who are not professional journalists. I think one of the biggest bias in news is just being in news. Um, that means you know people who work regular jobs, uh, who work the uh, third shift. When are you going to have a chance to have a voice in media? Um, you know that's a really really important thing. We have, like we publish truckers. When is a trucker going to have a voice in media? Um, again, I don't care if you're on the left or the right. We'll run you uh, because we want to amplify and to make sure that the only people who are spewing opinion into the media discourse are not from the exact same background. There's nothing wrong with being in 
college-educated journalist who lives in a big city. At least I hope not. Uh, but uh, you know, if that's the only voice that's allowed in media, uh, if that's the dominant voice that's allowed in media when it comes to opinion and when it comes to fact, uh, then we have a really big problem because I'm not representative of the country at all. And so I think at least at the Federalist, we're pretty cognizant of that. There are other places in conservative media that I don't think are cognizant of that and who will like treat Twitter back and forth like it's the most important thing in the world without realizing that nobody's actually on Twitter and like nobody cares who this random Twitter leftist is. They have no import outside of Twitter. Um, but all that is to say, I really, really hope in the future, this has been a good thing about YouTube and podcasts, um, voices outside of these sort of areas um, and outside of you know the geographic areas that media is located in and outside of media itself are able to have more of a media presence. Come on over here. So it sounds like at the Federalist, your strategy is to present an alternative to the big media outlets. And I'm just curious, Heavy, what about the idea of like a conservative Christian journalist going into the media outlets and working to change them from the inside? Like, have you ever tried that? Have there people who tried that? And, like, how successful were they? That's a great question. Um, Ten years ago, pretty much everyone in conservatism that you talked to would have been like, that's the gold standard. That's what we're trying to do. Um, where I work now at NJC, that was the goal of NJC for a really long time. And by the way, if you're interested in journalism, I put my card over there and I put NJC uh, QR codes over there. It's a 12-week spring or summer internship. Uh, we place you at a media outlet and give you training on Fridays and you get paid like 1500 bucks a month. It's a sweet gig. But um, everyone in the conservative movement thought that was the goal to kind of infiltrate the big corporate media outlets and um, <laughs> without like telling too many stories everyone's basically given up on that and I know for very many personal reasons exactly why um, the highest of the high people at some of these cor cor corporate media outlets uh, have taken these like lowly young conservative journalists and basically verbally tried to beat them into submission and they quit um, or some of them are verbally beaten into submission. Caitlin Collins, CNN show. I probably shouldn't even be saying this, but Caitlin, uh, she used to work at the Daily Caller. Um, she's someone who I look at and I think has been really affected by the atmosphere of CNN, uh, of just working at CNN. She's from Alabama. Uh, again, she used to work at the Daily Caller, um, especially back when it was just like a frat house. And she now is a very serious voice on CNN. Um, making millions of dollars a year. And I just, it was just one example of many. Um, and I know a lot of people who have quit. I know a lot of people who have gotten to the final stages of hiring, but have been honest about being Christians, being conservatives. Um, even though these outlets know all of their other little reporters are open leftists because they, you know, I know somebody who was in the CNN newsroom when the Dobbs decision came down and Roe was overturned. They said half the newsroom was crying. Right? These editors know the politics of their young reporters, but if anyone has different politics, they won't even let them into the group because they increasingly think that makes you anti-woman. Um, and that used to be something that was just kind of on secular college campuses, and now it's like really the mainstream dominant. You know, what was happening on campuses graduated and went into the real, so-called real world. Um, and now you know you're you're too icky to have in a newsroom. Um, oh, I know we're running late. But I have one really good example: Mike Pence. When uh, it was revealed that Mike Pence has a rule where he doesn't eat meals with women alone who aren't his wife, that comes out. The media like has a whole Handmaid's Tale freak out and depicts Mike Pence as like one of the men in The Handmaid's Tale. It's like this crazy fundamentalist, like gross Christian guy. And then someone commissioned a poll and found the majority of people in America were like, no, I would never do that either. <laughs> like, I'm not eating meals with people who are not my spouse. Uh, it's like meals where there's alcohol present, something like that. Um, and the media had spent like a month spinning their wheels about how unusual this was for Mike Pence. And then 60% of the country or something was like, yeah, that's crazy. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm with Mike Pence. Uh, so, I mean, if they find if they get a whiff of that on you it's just it's really hard i know like one well 
I know two people who were Christian conservatives um, and within the last five years have worked at uh, these corporate outlets uh, and they left. Um, one mostly by choice, one mostly not because it was just so hard. This is a person who didn't even like come out and reveal themselves to be a Christian conservative, um, but who would push back on some framing uh, and who would really, really well sourced person um, who would come with like the other side of the story and be like, well, actually, this is what Republicans are really saying. Um, most of the time when the Hill report or when these outlets report on what uh, Hill Republicans are saying, they're just talking to like McCarthy's people. They're talking to the establishment people. They're not talking to like Freedom Caucus people um, because they don't want to talk to those guys. Um, so and it's the same thing. Like they're mostly talking to Pelosi's people and Dem leadership's people. Um, they don't talk to the others, so they don't actually really even know what's going on in the Hill. Like I, f the amount of times that they've, I've just watched them screw things up about meetings that are happening. That they like, I, I'll be like talking to the people that they're reporting on. It's just, like you, is, you have no idea what's happening right now. Um, and just for reporting that side of the story or pushing this giant corporate outlet to report that side of the story. This person was basically pushed out of town. Um, they didn't want that person there. Um, so it's really, really hard. I think the goal is to create an incentive structure where those new media outlets that are kind of open about whether they're on the left or the right, and there's a lot of them, like public news with Michael Schellenberger, he's kind of in between. He's like, he's sort of, he's always kind of been on the left, but now he's kind of on the right. Um, but he's honest about what his opinions are and just some really good reporting. I think the best way forward is for more journalists to see that as a path, um, and that will create an incentive structure uh, where outlets like that can flourish and you can have a good career as an honest journalist, whether you're on the left or the right, whether you're Christian or Jewish uh, or non-religious, um, you can be honest about your bias and serve your audience better that way. Does that make sense? Cool. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Seriously, please, I, I'm just Emily at thefederalist.com. My business card with my YAF emails over there. If you ever need anything from me, you guys are close. I uh, would love for you guys to do NJC, but thank you so, so much for the Center of Conservative Women, to YWA, to Patrick Henry, to all of you for coming. I really appreciate it, and stay in touch if you want to. I'm more than happy to, to chat with you about media and anything going on. So thank you.